Hello, can you hear me? Okay. My name is Anuj Bhatnagar. I'm a family medicine doctor. I specialize in geriatrics. I've been practicing geriatrics for three, four years now. Uh, we have two clinics. One is in Millersville and uh, other other one is in Pasadena. It's adult and senior care. So um, I want to thank Kevin for organizing this event. And I want to thank you all for coming in today. So let's get started. I'm sorry. I have no disclosures. Uh, these are these are our objectives for tonight. We'll talk about uh, how geriatrics is different than usual internal or family medicine. We'll talk about differences between normal memory loss and dementia, screening and diagnosis of dementia, treatment of dementia, including new research, new, uh, sorry, and discuss brain health, discuss complications of dementia, plan for the future. Lot to learn about this evening. I consider geriatrics as a quarterback. Um, first line of treatment, like you come in in, a, in, a, in, a, in an office of a primary care provider, we have our line backers, wide receivers. We kind of navigate you through the system and uh, as, as a patient, where we are and um, those kind of things. We all already have specialists, so pertaining to this particular talk, we have specialists as uh, Dr. Jasti, who's our who's our colleague in the you know, in, in the in the center, and he kind of helps us in case we have questions or we have uh, uh, we we need to need know more about that particular disorder. So as I said, we'll talk about a little bit of a difference between adult medicine and geriatrics. Adult medicine has like family medicine or internal medicine. We talk about like your screening, your medical problems, like diabetes, blood pressure, heart disease, uh, immunizations. But in geriatrics, we have these things covered as well. So if there is an intervention, we, talk, we, we, we discuss about risk and benefits. Are the benefits higher than any risk for that particular intervention? It's about shared decision making. If a medication like a brain, like a, a a, a, a med which is ha which is having several side effects. Do you, do you have options to choose from? Sometimes we ju don't jump on to start treating something. We kind of have watchful waiting and close observation. Customization of care is the key to geriatrics, where one intervention that works for one 85 year old doesn't work for another 85 year old. Goals of care discussion: What do you really want? What are your wishes? and geriatric syndromes. Geriatric syndromes are, I consider them as quality of life issues and they are linked to your medical problems. So how your medical problems are affecting your quality of life issues like depression, eyes and ear disorders, falls, if you have problems with incontinence, are you sleeping okay? Are you eating okay? Is your mood okay? So, and your medical problems, if you have too many medical problems and you have too many medications, that can impact your geriatric syndrome. And you will ask me, how do I get time to talk about these things? Because usually primary care is 15 minute visit. So that's how adult and geriatrics, it's, it's a little bit different because for a new patient, we have an hour set up. And for a follow up, we have half an hour. And that's how we can help you guys more. So let's jump on to the last geriatric syndrome, which is dementia. It derives from a Latin word uh, called depart and mens meaning mind. As we go along, we'll talk about different kinds of dementia. We'll talk about the, the demographics and why do, I, why, why do I care about this problem? This is a busy slide. But I want you to focus on this section, right there on the x-axis. As we are going from 1900, 2050, if you look at this, this population is 65 plus, and this population is increasing. And we are right here. It's not going down, 
it's actually going up. Dimension Alzheimer's. Some of the numbers, just to, just to think about, over 5 million people living with Alzheimer's dementia and, uh, and Alzheimer's disease nationally. Caregiver estimates range from 6 to 15 million people. It's sixth leading cause of death in the USA. And one of the JAMA uh, paper mentioned it's a third leading cause of death. Staggering amount of number of hours caregivers are putting in to take care of patients with dementia. Again, I just want you to focus on, this is a disease pattern which is kind of increasing with age. So this is the age on the x-axis right here, and the same for the incidence. As we are going from 60 to 95, it's going up. It's, it's going up and increasing. Some more numbers, just to combine those numbers with some dollar amount. It's staggering approximately $200 billion per year. That's a cost for, for taking care of all the, dementia, all the patients with dementia in the US. Average cost of taking care of one patient is approximately 50,000 per year per person. It's more expensive in the last five years of your life than any other disease. Alzheimer's disease is the most expensive disease. And a lot of people think most of the most of the patients with dementia live in nursing homes, but that's not, that's not the fact. 70% people with Alzheimer's disease live and are cared for at home. A little bit of a background. Uh, Dr. Alois, uh, Alois Alzheimer, in 1906, uh, this was his patient, August Dieter. Post-mortem, he did a biopsy on her brain because she was experiencing symptoms of visual hallucinations so he found out the amyloid plaque, and we watched that video in a bit. Amyloid plaque is kind of, was the etiological factor or, or the causative factor for her hallucinations and, and uh, cortical atrophy. And that, that's how this term was uh, coined on his name, all that. This is the most common question I hear from my patient population when I see patients in the clinic. Doctor, I have bad memory. Do I have dementia? I just want to say, stop uh, abusing your spouses. <laughs> so simple memory loss is not dementia. We should always think about uh, if you have vitamin B12 deficiency, if you have thyroid problems, uh, you should be screened for depression. So talk to your primary doctor or a, or a specialist about, uh, do I have these problems? Because simple memory loss is not dementia. And we'll talk about these, these uh, things down the road. This is another question, it's why uh, what is mild cognitive impairment or MCI? So normal aging, loss of, or deficits in your memory, you can have, you can have deficits in your, uh, in, for mild cognitive impairment in, on four domains. One of the domain is memory loss. The second is you are unable to speak or write. Visuospatial is Let's say, for example, this is a rectangular board. This might appear to you as distorted. So you're not able to feel that, that particular shape. And executive functions, like you came to this lecture tonight, you knew what you have to do to come in. You, have, you knew where to drive. You knew what, what to dress. You, you, you put the address in the GPS or whatsoever. So you, you knew what things need to be done after what. And the next phase is dementia. So normal aging, and this, this particular arrow is, is important because MCI is one of all these, out of these four domains, normal aging can have simple memory loss. So that's why I just put this arrow there. 15 percent patients with amnestic, uh, sorry, 15 percent patients with only memory loss, like amnestic MCI, can transform into Alzheimer's dementia. So again, four domains right there. Memory, new problem with words, spoken or written, visual spa images and spatial relationships, and challenges with planning and solving problems. So you should have, for dementia, for diagnosis of dementia, you should have two things out of these four for sure. And this, these two things are affecting your activities of daily living. So how your functions are being affected. Are you able to manage your own medications? Are you able to 
fix your own meal or are you able to drive or are you able to manage your finances so basically the functionality so two of those domains affecting your functions is dementia so normal memory loss is not dementia we'll watch a video so that The electrical charges release chemical messengers called neurotransmitters. The transmitters move across microscopic gaps or synapses between neurons. They bind to receptor sites on the dendrites of the next neuron. This cellular circuitry enables communication within the brain. Healthy neurotransmission is important for the brain to function well. Alzheimer's disease disrupts this intricate interplay. By compromising the ability of neurons to communicate with one another, the disease over time destroys memory and thinking skills. Scientific research has revealed some of the brain changes that take place in Alzheimer's disease. Abnormal structures called beta amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles are classic biological hallmarks of the disease. Plaques form when specific proteins in the neurons' cell membrane are processed differently. Normally, an enzyme called alpha-secretase sniffs amyloid precursor protein, or APP, releasing a fragment. A second enzyme, gamma-secretase, also sniffs APP in another place. These released fragments are thought to benefit neurons. In Alzheimer's disease, the first cut is made most often by another enzyme, beta-secretase. That, combined with the cut made by gamma-secretase, results in the release of short fragments of APP, called beta amyloid. When these fragments clump together, they become toxic and interfere with the function of neurons. As more fragments are added, these oligomers increase in size and become insoluble, eventually forming beta amyloid plaques. Neurofibrillary tangles are made when a protein called tau is modified. In normal brain cells, tau stabilizes structures critical to the cell's internal transport system. Nutrients and other cellular cargo are carried up and down the structures called microtubules to all parts of the neuron. In Alzheimer's disease, abnormal tau separates from the microtubules, causing them to fall apart. Strands of this tau combine to form tangles inside the neuron, disabling the transport system and destroying the cell. Neurons in certain brain regions disconnect from each other and eventually die, causing memory loss. As these processes continue, the brain shrinks and loses function. We now know a great deal about changes that take place in the brain with Alzheimer's disease, but there is still much to learn. What other changes are taking place in the aging brain and its cells? And what influence do other diseases, genetics, and lifestyle factors have on the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease as the brain and body age? Scientific research is helping to unravel the mystery of Alzheimer's and related brain disorders. As we learn more, researchers move ever closer to discovering ways to treat and ultimately prevent this devastating fatal disease. All right, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, risk factors for dementia, as we all know, high blood pressure affects the arteries in the brain, and that can uh, that's a risk factor. Uncontrolled diabetes is an important risk factor. High cholesterol is a risk factor. Lack of physical exercise, uh, a lifestyle which is unhealthy eating is another risk factor. Smoking is a
<laughs> Sorry. Smoking is another risk factor. Social isolation, depression, lack of so engagement uh, in the community is, is a big risk factor. Head trauma has been seen, has been observed as a risk factor. If you had a, had a history of head trauma or uh, accident in the past. Hearing loss, uh, many research studies have been coming up that if you have that blockage of the reception in your, uh, in your if you have hearing deficits, that can impede your memory down the road. Medications, uh, Xanax is one of the big medication that can cause dementia and people have been taking it forever. I mean, I, I usually look at the medications very closely uh, when I see a new patient because medications, I think, is the most common cause because when I ask a new patient, are you, why are you taking this medication? And they would say, 40 years ago, a doctor started me on this and I don't know why I'm taking it. Uh, the next uh, medication is Tylenol PM, which is, uh, it has a component called as diphenhydramine, uh, which is known to cause dementia uh, and cognitive impairment. Oxycontin, for that matter, any, any opioids are known to cause dementia, but Again, I see this all the time that they have been all on Oxycontin, or Oxycontin, Oxycodone, Hydromorphone forever. Benadryl, uh, people take it as candies. But again, if you take it for a long time, unobserved, that can also has shown to cause cognitive impairment. I'm going through these types of dementia just to show you this Alzheimer's is not the only cause of dementia. There are several other causes. I don't want you, be, you, to, you, you, you to be overwhelmed with, but Alzheimer's is the big elephant in the room, and other dementia do exist. That's the take home message from next three slides. So Alzheimer's is the most common cause. Vascular, you have stepwise decline. Parkinson's associated dementia. Lewy body dementia, which has more of hallucination symptoms. Frontotemporal dementia is kind of an early onset, has a change in personality. That's the most common. Supranuclear palsy, Huntington's disease, alcohol-induced dementia. There was a patient I was seeing last week, and he had signs and symptoms of dementia, and he was drinking 12 cans of beer every day. And I asked him, do you know why? And he said no. Normal pressure hydrocephalus prime disease, HIV AIDS. This is a question for you if you want to give it a try. Which US president was diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia? All right, this is one of the, this is one of the slide I like. I discuss that in person when I'm seeing patients. I just want to go with you, over with you. So on the, again, on the x-axis right here, is zero to 100 years, zero to 100 years right there. So, so anybody who has, who has born has to die. Who is not agreeable to that statement? <laughs> so first thing, first thing you do is, when you are born, you, you cry. And then you start feeding. And you, you start developing. So let's say, for example, you never develop dementia. The chances of you living to 100 are higher. But if you, for unfortunate reasons, you started having cognitive impairment, we are right here. And then you might have some good days, not so good days. Some good days, not so good days, and thereafter. In this particular prognostical, uh, in, in, in this particular prognosis, we are trying, when you, when you look at these, these declines right there, a decline right here, let's say for example you were walking with a walker, or you were walking with a cane, you had a fall, and falls are the most common complications for dementia. You had a fall, you break your hip, you're not able to walk with that cane anymore. You're walking with a walker or probably in the wheelchair. So your baseline functions decline from here to here. The goal of, of management in dementia is to keep everything stable. So if, if your function go down from here to here, I would do every measures to keep it as long as possible. If your function for us unfortunately goes down from here to here, we'll do everything possible to keep it stable. Two, pneumonia, that's why we are very pushy for, um, for, uh, for, for your flu shots. Hospitalizations, 
each each day you spend in ICU or in the wards, there is a seven percent decline in your functions because these proximal muscles in your thigh, you don't use them and you lose them. So that's the reason. Uh, after three nights of hospital stay, stay, we are we are like okay, then let's go to a rehab and then starts you, your all full casket starts for physical therapy and stuff like that. So we try to avoid so these three things. We try to avoid in um, in dementia. This is a, this was a scary article when I kind of reviewed it. The low rates of recognition of dementia by physicians constitute a major barrier because of the time because of the knowledge, physicians are not able to recognize in the primary care setting. The second alarming feature was family members. So your eyes don't see what your mind doesn't know. So the family members, in, sorry, in this, particular, in this particular study, the family members had more idea or more knowledge about four most common cancers, cardiovascular diseases, high blood pressure, but when they were taking care of their loved ones, uh, they were unrecognized. The, the symptoms for Alzheimer's dementia were unrecognized because they didn't know about them. <coughs> the question comes, should we screen? This is the task force. Uh, this task force gives us physicians the guidelines of what to screen, what not to screen. They say there's insufficient evidence. But people still want to screen. They still want to know if, if there's a diagnostic. They, they want to know their diagnosis and prognosis. They want to talk about their anticipatory guidance, like advanced care planning. If, if their loved one has dementia, they want to know whether this person is safe to take their own medications. Is this person safe to drive? If, the, if, this, if, if this particular person is safe living at home by himself or herself. Cons, bad things, unnecessary anxiety and fear if it's diagnosed earlier. There's no disease-modifying treatment or agent available. That means if you start something, there's no medication that can halt the progression of the disease, unfortunately. There are treatments which are available, but symptomatic treatments are marginally successful. And there's little evidence of improved outcomes with early recognition. So what they're saying is why to detect it early if we have, we have no system in place to treat it. Diagnosis of dementia. The best thing you can do to diagnose dementia is take a tissue sample from the brain, but that's barbaric, nobody does it. <laughs> what we can do about it? We, look, we, try, we try to look at the brain from three different angles. We try to have a blood, blood test check. Let's say vitamin B12, as I said initially, thyroid. If you, if you had, a, all of a sudden you had a decline in your cognition, we can check your blood count if you're losing blood from somewhere, if your kidney functions and liver functions are okay, an autoimmune workup. Other way we look at the brain is asking you questions. The, one of the most common is mini mental status examination. It's, it's NMSE right here. And this one is MOCA, which is Montreal uh, Cognitive Assessment. Slums and neuropsychological testing. Uh, neuropsychological testing is a three to four hour questionnaire which can actually stratify different kinds of dementia. It's useful, but a lot of questions. Um, and we, we usually recommend that we should get it done before you come and see us. But we have resources where we, we, can, we can send you to get it done. Imaging, CT head, MRI, PET scanning. A lot of uh, other specialists might add a DAT scanning for Parkinson's, associated dementia, and EEG. A myeloid uh, imaging is on a research basis only. It's not, it's not recommended outside research. Genetic testing. Uh, you must have seen on the television about APOE4, uh, very, very commonly marketed. The sad part about that is APOE4 gene is the most risk associated gene but if you have two copies of this gene this is what they say if you have two copies you have a high risk of developing Alzheimer's dementia but a real outcomes for if you have two copies you have the risk if you don't have two copies you still have the risk so 
why to create unnecessary anxiety if we don't know what this really means? Again, I, I usually consider if you have a problem, if you have already decided on the outcome, why to do that intervention? So problem, intervention, outcome, in this particular case, there is no point doing this intervention because it's creating unnecessary anxiety. It's only at the, well, it's not clinically integrated. This is what, what I would so Treatments, medications, and brain health is non-pharmacological. I don't want you to be overwhelmed again with the names of the medications. This is just to show uh, what is available. Just to give you a little bit of a background history on, on, on these medications. The first medication for dementia came out in 1996. By 2003, we had four medications. In 2007, this, this patch came out. And 2014, we had 23 milligrams. But from, 19, from 2003, actually, till now, there's no new medication in the market. So these three medications are commonly used. And this act on one part of the brain, basically. The other group of is, is uh, an MDA receptor antagonist. Again, don't worry about the name. Because it works on the other part of the brain to replace that chemical. So I have serious problem with these studies. All, are stu all studies are funded by drug companies. <laughs> Small and short, they did not give me any, there's no studies that has published that can tell me if these medications will prolong your shifting in the nursing home. Or are these medications causing any kind of death? So I don't have that information from any of these studies. Then how these numbers, when they say, is translating to your daily life? If they say your MMSC improved from uh, five points from 18 to 25, how that translates to, to the daily life, they don't tell us. How long they are effective, when I ask them, how long should I treat my patients in those uh, articles, nobody tells us how long. There have been four big trials, oh, sorry, three big trials coming out on all the, these four risk factors, Aricept, a, there, was a, there was a clinical trial that came out that had uh, patients who were taking Aricep for more than three years ended up having a pacemaker implantation. And we don't know if, if Aricep was really working there or not. A lot of falls with Aricep. And uh, a big, big study uh, came out last year that talked about hip fractures. So again, in genetics, it's all day. This is this I can do all day. Risk and benefits discussion. New medications. These four were tried in the last decade, and they failed. Amalar antibodies. Um, one of them is coming out in 2019. Um, not sure about the phase of the clinical trial, but they're working on it. Amalar is a plaque which you saw, and this particular medication work on that plaque. Now researchers are asking these questions to themselves. Are we, are we targeting too late? So can we develop a vaccine? Because the real symptoms are, the disease process starts 15 to, 15 to maybe, maybe two decades earlier than the real symptoms. So are we targeting too late? Should we start giving something at 50 years, like a shingle shot, like a vaccine for dementia, something like that? All that is dementia is not Alzheimer's. So there was, there was a study on a, uh, on a mice model which they talked about mice was injected with the gene APOE4, but that did not develop amyloid. Uh, am amyloid. So now they started questioning whether amyloid is the only thing that is causing Alzheimer's dementia. The question is, is amyloid the right target? So that's what the research is going on in that particular direction. This is the pipeline. Again, don't worry about the names. I just wanted to show you what is coming this year, end of this year. This is the vaccine I was talking about, uh, phase three clinical trials, 2019. Amyloid antibodies, that amyloid plaque, is, these antibodies work on it, act, act on them. This medication is, uh, is in phase two clinical trial right now, and this is specifically for behavioral disruption in dementia, and they're working on it. 
and base inhibitors. I mean, the problem, the problem is um, when they inject the mice with, uh, with the APOE4 gene and that, that mice develops dementia and they, they, try, they try a medication, medication works. Once they apply that in the clinical trials, human beings have not only dementia, they also have other problems. So the whole picture becomes mixed up. That's the biggest factor from, a, from a my standpoint. Brain health, physical activity, nobody can beat that. Cognitive stimulation, um, crossword puzzles, social engagement, and healthy diet. These are the four factors that have shown in good studies, good articles, that can halt any cognitive impairment or dementia. I'm going to talk about four products, four supplements available in the market. That's just my opinion. This is highly controversial. This is solely my opinion on my experience. So don't get offended. <laughs> so Ginkgo is uh, a supplement available, which a lot of people think has good effects. With, it causes uh, improvement or treatment of dementia. I would be very cautious if you're on blood thinners because this particular product can increase uh, possibility of bleeding. And as far as dementia is concerned, reviewing any evidence available, no, uh, no evidence that it prevents dementia. Second supplement is vitamin E. Um, again, trials did not show any increased risk. So again, risk and benefit discussion, we are at the same level, harmless. If you're taking it, that's totally fine. But as far as dementia is concerned, no evidence that it affects or helps us. Coconut oil. Uh, people thought that it provides um, alternative source of energy instead of glucose. So they, sa they said, let's start taking it. Unknown effects on heart disease because of uh, structural changes. No evidence for or against dementia. So again, if you want it, you can take it. It doesn't harm you. Uh, this is the fourth product, which I, I totally fail to understand how it was, it's marketed. <laughs> marketed on television every single day. Um, FDA, FDA released a warning on this product for in 2012 that it can, it's causing seizures, strokes, and syncope, chest pain. This, and this is the letter they sent to Quincy. And if you look at this particular point uh, on the bottom, there are no peer-reviewed human research on safety. So it might be working on their mice model again. It's actually dangerous for human beings. And that's what they said. You have to be careful before, before talking about this product to the public. So. Uh, my approach to the medications, I kind of go with uh, RSF to start with, like you diagnose somebody and MRI and blah, blah, blah. So you kind of discuss about uh, side effects. You discuss about what works best for you. So open it up with, it, it, can, it can cause GI side effects, nausea, vomiting, RSF is very commonly known. It can also, if it's not working, you should be cautious. Uh, uh, if you have a pacemaker, I, I would not be starting that medication on you. What, what are those memory testing? What, what does that mean in your daily life? So if I have MMSC of 23 today, or MMSC of 20 today, what I'm expecting in six months, or 12 months, or 18 months? And that has to be spelled out. That medications are symptomatic. It doesn't delay the progression of the disease. Nothing can halt. So let's say, for example, if I start somebody today, I'll have him come, him or her come back in three to six months. In three months, I'll ask the caregiver, are you seeing, is it standstill or is it going down? Two choice, it's not going up. Is it, is your loved one in the last three months stable or is he or she going down? And that's how you kind of get that information. If it's going down, of course, we have to wean it off. If it's stable, let's keep going, unless you start developing any side effects. We set up a reasonable goal for the treatment. 
either six months to 12 months and see where we are going. Even in studies that showed benefits, so Eriseth in 2014 or 2013 end, uh, Eriseth was available in 5 and 10 milligrams. On an 80 point scale, FDA approved it from 78. So on an 80 point scale, this person, uh, a cohort of people, like maybe like 50 people, the, the scale improved from 78 to 80. And FDA said, this particular dose works, and they approved it, surprisingly. So even in studies that showed benefit, many patients did not have benefit that was generally noticeable to others. So if you translate this study on a, on a real basis in the clinical world, there was no benefit in, in their functionality. And that's what we are talking about. Depression and dementia overlap with each other. So if I have a doubt, if this person is, has depression, I would treat depression aggressively before treating dementia first. Again, risk and benefit discussion because we don't have much scope for dementia. If I find that my tool for depression, we are sh they are showing some kinds of depression, I would treat depression aggressively, starting with the lowest dose possible. Some of the safety issues. Driving. People, are, people might get lost or they have accidents or near misses. Physicians in Maryland are not mandated to report, but if we have to report, MVA protects us. I have not reported anybody yet. Uh, this, this testing, we have resources. Mount Sinai does it. Uh, it's out of pocket, $300. Uh, it's a very important issue. I mean, it's almost like taking away independence from somebody. It's, I have people who, are, who have cried when we have talked about this. Medication management, is your loved one able to manage their box with their medication in a pill bottle or pill boxes? If they're living alone, are they safe to live alone? Are they falling over and over again? Finances, are they signing their own checks, managing their own debit cards or credit cards? Are they paying their bills? Gun safety or weapons, are they, they have weapons at home. Because with Alzheimer's, you start having behavioral disruptions and that's a big complication. Talking about complications, wandering and behavioral disruptions are the biggest. People leave their houses. What we can do about it? The starting point is redirection, like we do for the kids. If they are absorbed with some kind of activity or they are kind of trying to get over it, you kind of do a redirection or console them. Sometimes they become unconsolable. You cannot console them. In that case, so again, I start these dangerous medications. I don't even call them medications. I call them toxic chemicals. So you have to pay, you have to choose your poison. So olanzapine is one of the one, uh, one, of, one of the antipsychotics. It has FDA black box warning. Again, we discuss everything. When these behaviors start affecting your functions, then then we are liable to start these medications. Unfortunately. Uh, Behavioral disruptions in dementia are the most common causes, most common factors that pay people are placed in nursing home. We have a geriatric psychiatrist in our, in our system. Uh, we get consultation from kind of help. <coughs> Planning for the future. CMG One Call Care Management. Uh, Rachel Anderson is one of our point of contact. She kinds of helps help us navigate our patient population through advanced directives, proxies with driving assessments, financial planning. Caregiver stress is huge. If we cannot take care of the patients appropriately with lack of resources, with especially medications, what can we do for the caregivers who are stressed out or taking care of their loved one? So Rachel kind of helps us with this particular care program we have. When we are making decisions, we have, we have, have to keep in mind person right in front of us is the most important person. We should not be taking away their rights. So we do medical decision-making capacity in the clinic. Um, is this person able to make best decisions for himself or herself? And then we go on the job. These are some of your resources. It's in your handout. I would highly recommend this book. Don't read it cover to cover. You'll get over. I think it's from one of my mentors from UCLA. Um, Excellent.
So take home points. Only memory loss is not dementia. Your loved one can have good days and bad days. Use medications carefully and wisely. Learn how to improve brain health. Use of supplement has very limited evidence. Plan for the future and seek medical help. Thank you.